I'm Laura Cassidy from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from the American Chemical Society Spring 2019 National Meeting in Orlando. We're joined today by Dr. Tricia Andrew from the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Amherst. She will be discussing her development of smart pajamas that could monitor and help improve sleep. Dr. Andrew? Thank you, Laura. So our lab uh, is called a Wearable Electronics Lab, and we make garments and uh, transform them using a surface coating in order to actually get an electrical signal out of them. And what Laura is showing right here is a pajama shirt that we outfitted with a few pressure sensors around the torso area. Those pressure sensors actually monitor breaths um, as you're breathing in and out while wearing this very loose pajama shirt. And on the next slide, you could just see the, the process, a, a very quick overview of the process of how we put these together. There are five total sensors, two in the front, one in the back, and one on each of your sides. The two in the front, one is a pressure sensor that just uh, figures out if you're pressed up against a surface, and the one on the bottom that's colored green actually allows you to see how you're breathing as you're pressed up against that surface. And on the bottom, you could see the uh, entire circuitry that goes into it, and then uh, the inside of the shirt, you could see as it's being assembled before a lining has been put on it. And the next one, you actually see the, the electrical output out of this shirt. And what you're seeing is actually a few users uh, being directed to sleep in a few positions. So there's roughly six positions that about 90% of the population adopts when they sleep. Um, and they are shown on the bottom of that screen. Fetus is the most common uh, uh, position at about 41% of the population. And on the top, you can see the graph. There's different line uh, voltage lines for each of the sensors that uh, arise for different sleep positions. And so if you look from the top down for each of those signals, you could actually classify which position you're sleeping in. And on the last slide is a video of my student, Ali, uh, who's wearing that uh, pajama shirt. Uh, you're seeing the, the sleep lab at the UMass Amherst, and he's wearing our, our blue silk pajama shirt. He's going to turn around. Uh, it may take a little bit of time, but he gave me a lot of time to actually explain this, this video. Uh, and in the front, you can see the monitor. If you train your eye to the bottom two lines, those are the ch ones that change the most as he's actually cycling through these positions. So he's in fetus now, and now he's going to go onto his face. And that's free faller. And you could see the transitions as he's moving around, and then the signal stabilizes because, again, it adopts a particular classification based on how you're sleeping. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. I just wanted to really understand how knowing this information can then help somebody sleep better. What's the evidence that actually knowledge of you know these different uh, positions and uh, heart rate and, and things like that that it works, that, that we can do something with that? That's a great question. So <clears throat> just knowing about your sleep posture is actually, a, I would say, an intellectual question that, that came about as we are making our garments. It's, uh, we're trying to just globally and constantly answer the question, you know, what kind of information do you want if, if you're wearing a smart garment and you're, you're comfortable wearing it? And the, the answers are, are not actually, uh, they're few and far between. Uh, there's not that much information that I could give you that would warrant you wearing a, a smart shirt. But some of the things that we thought about were, you know, if I ask you um, how you're eating, you know that. You can monitor that if you so want. It, but if I ask you how you're sleeping at night, it's fairly personal information about yourself. Um, and you don't know the answer to that. And if you wanted to for some reason, you needed someone to actually physically watch you. Um, and that was really the, the thing that motivated us because most of the time when you're sleeping, you also happen to be wearing a garment. And so we thought if we could have something that tells you how you're sleeping at night, then you could start to get that information about yourself. The first slide that I showed you, the, the peaks that I was showing you there, um, I wasn't showing you a classification of, of postures. So that wasn't showing you how you're sleeping, but each of those peaks was actually your breath, okay? So what I didn't show you on these slides is that not only if you see this baseline voltage, you could just look across and say, this is how I'm sleeping. I'm free falling or I'm fetus. 
Um, but if you actually look at that breathing pattern, that reveals exactly how you're breathing during your sleep. And when you look at that, that tells you the frequency of that breath tells you if you're going into REM sleep or not. Um, if you suddenly stop breathing, that's called sleep apnea. And so not only are we telling you which position you're sleeping in, but when you correlate that to your breathing, that tells you, okay, in this position, I'm getting more apnea, right? Or I start out trying to be fetus, which is what everyone recommends that you sleep in. And then for some reason at night, I'm going free faller, which is on your face. And it actually inhibits and, and hinders your breathing at night. And so you could start to find corrective ways to, to you know, help you sleep better. And sleep quality has actually been shown to not only... Um, improve neuroplasticity as you age, uh, but in, in, uh, increases the, the probability that you could deal with stress better when you're awake. Um, and then there are other studies that are still undergoing, but I think everyone has an intuitive sense that if you have good sleep, then you generally have a better quality of life. So, And how are these things powered? So they're self-powered. Um, actually, the, the little button uh, circuit that, that was in the second slide there, it has... Um, a small Bluetooth transmitter, and they're powered with a, a fiber-based supercapacitor that we sewed onto the garment that was a, a separate uh, device that my lab made. Uh, and so you don't actually need to have this plugged into the wall as, as you're sleeping. The Bluetooth that my student actually used for, for this button in this pajama shirt is a very, very low power consuming thing and it would really hook on to something like your iPhone or if you really want it, uh, a, a, la um, a laptop that you have um, with any Bluetooth receiver. And it functions for about eight hours without needing to be recharged. And so you could have about eight hours of sleep at night roughly and continuously send signals about how you're sleeping. And I'm just wondering as well, because there's an awful lot of talk these days about um, the disposable, the problems of textiles, wastes, and et cetera. And this presumably, you know, would impact on recyclability of textiles, for example. And what's the environmental impact, you know, in terms of the electronics that goes into the materials and, you know, um, basically, yeah, o over its whole life cycle, what's the environmental Sort of I, th thank you. I feel like someone planted you here to give, ta help me do all my talking points. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, our, the the way these textiles are made, actually, the the technique that my lab uses is a process called reactive vapor deposition, and it's actually very unique. A lot of uh, textile manufacturing is actually no textile manufacturer uses that process. It was something that uh, I thought about when I was an assistant professor. It comes from uh, the silicon uh, integrated circuits industry is actually a method that you use to make electronic materials. And, and we asked the question if we could use the same thing to make organic polymers. And uh, there were a couple of just processing reasons for that we could deal with very rough surfaces. Uh, but the really great part about this reactive vapor deposition is that it's solvent free uh, and it doesn't actually have a lot of water vase waste and, and dye waste that actually fills up uh, the waterways as you uh, are making these textiles. And that really is the, the primary cause of, of textile pollution. It was actually a really great article that I still have and I cite often uh, from, the, from the ACS in 2015 by Adam Scott talking about textile pollution. So the World Bank in 2015 estimated that 20% of water pollution globally actually comes from the manufacturing and dyeing of, of textiles. And our, since our process actually doesn't use any solvents, that you don't really have that waste coming around. And the materials are, are organic, uh, as we chemists like to call them. They're basically uh, largely carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur-based. And so they're not toxic metals. Um, they are oftentimes chewed up by bacteria in the environment. So they uh, kind of go back into the earth, if you will. Um, and so it, it really is a, a fairly green process, the way we make these, these pressure sensors. I just wanted to, I thought there was some silver in, involved as There's well. There's the that? silver threads uh, that are the interconnects over there. Yeah. Um, and those are actually also made by a reactive vapor deposition process in our lab. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bela Buslag, ACS. Um, what's the durability of the fabric? Uh, fabric? Obviously, uh, pajamas particularly uh, uh, need to be washed relatively frequently, uh, how long do, uh, does a pair of pajamas uh, last? 
So uh, I think you're I think you're asking two questions. So one, can we wash this, or can can you sleep in it overnight and sweat it in? It's gross. Do you have to you know not keep it not keep it away from the washing machine? And these are washable. So uh, d different components that we we make in our lab, we've tried out at, at different washing machines or accelerated uh, washing facilities. So the individual devices in that kind of uh, assembly picture that was in the slide, those have withstood about 30 to 40 uh, wash cycles in different facilities. The pajama itself that we, we showed you in this image, uh, the outer uh, garment was literally something we bought from a fabric store. Um, it was a fast fashion thing. I really can't say that it was something that we made ourselves, but it was just something that we bought. Uh, we, what we wanted to do was show that we could sew our components on to anything that you want. And so if we actually are going to make a device, we'd start with something that is really probably a microfiber device, most likely, and that is very washable. And then we just sew our pressure sensors and the lining uh, into that garment. And the devices themselves are, again, very washable. And so you could wash this as much as you want. As far as the overlong, overall long-term longevity of this, I think that really comes down to the lifetime of the, the starting shirt that you, you have. Um, the, the fabrics that we, we make, the electronic fabrics that we make, uh, really don't change their mechanical properties from the starting material. And so they last pretty much as long as a cotton thread or, or a swatch of cotton lasts, which is fairly long. Um, so I'm not going to say that these are going to last you know, tens of years, but over six months, over roughly the time that you would want to wear a pair of pajamas, they definitely maintain their uh, mechanical stability. Thank you. Um, when it comes to uh, to the piezoelectric sensors, uh, what kind are they? The ones I'm familiar with are mostly ceramics of various sorts, the sorts containing, among other things, barium and, and various uh, heavy metals that uh, aren't exactly uh, desirable in human contact. So these are actually tribal electric sensors. They're not piezos. We, we made a hip belt uh, to kind of figure out your gate motion that's not part of this, but those have a piezoelectric sensor with barium titanate. Um, so first of all, barium titanate turns out is actually biocompatible among the other ceramics out there. Uh, but I agree with you. It, it is a ceramic, and we had to go to a couple lengths to make them flexible. But for the sleep shirt, there's actually no ceramics. There's no inorganics. It's a triboelectric and a pressure sensor. Uh, and the coatings for each of the fabrics there are all organic-based. Now, you mentioned the, the limitation on, on powering these thing, uh, things. Uh, why not in incorporate a button cell into the button? We the first version that we have that's not pictured you had a uh, in chip in line uh, power cell so our fiber supercapacitors actually match the the current state of the art in line micro supercapacitors that go in the PCBs and so we like the idea of actually having a thread that's also your charge storage unit. Thank you. Katie Cottingham ACS. So how comfortable are these pajamas? Also a great question. Thank you uh, for allowing me the talking point. Uh, so we, in the re user study that we published, so uh, right now about 40 people have worn it for about two hours and eight people have worn it overnight at our sleep facility at UMass. And so we, we have them fill out a little user survey after they use it and uh, questions include, you know, do you prefer this over a Fitbit? And about 17 out of 25 who answered the survey said yes. Um, and all 40 out of the 40 who tried it out said that they were uh, their sleep pattern is completely inhibited um, with this shirt, and so it felt like they were just wearing a shirt to sleep. So I take that to mean it's it's pretty comfortable. Okay, and um, so how does the pajama compare with smart mattresses and other gadgets that are on the market for monitoring heart rate and? things like that? So there are actually not that many devices fully on the market. There are a lot of uh, devices shown. The one that is on the market is actually a $15,000 smart mattress that's meant for nursing homes. Um, and it has these motion sensors that are, are hooked up to the mattress as opposed to the person. And the problem is if you are uh, shuffling around a lot at night or if you have a person sleeping with you, uh, the signal quality that comes out of those mattresses is, is quite terrible. And so you actually need a, a licensed you know, biostatistics 
physician effectively um, or a nursing professional to kind of look at that data and, and get something meaningful out, meaningful out of it. Um, and so if you're a regular consumer, and for example, if you're just curious how you're sleeping at night, uh, it's first of all, a lot of money and, and not enough data quality to really justify that. Uh, the other kind of uh, academic examples of, of devices that are out there um, oftentimes use cameras. So right now, the, the best way, the most effective way to monitor people moving around is to physically film them. And we see that in CGI movies, and that is the, the state of the art, literally. Um, and so you basically go in a facility and have someone film you with maybe a couple of reflectors on yourself, and then you get a bio model of, of how you're sleeping at night. And so, again, it's a fairly sophisticated facility with costs associated in a particular location. So this is portable, and it's fully self-powered. And when do you think this would be on the market? <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if any investors are out there, I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> any other questions? Oh, one over here. Uh, um, the sensors and everything that uh, that make you make the measurements well they do make measurements do you have any uh, uh, desire of trying to integrate it in with the mattresses and whatever have you fifteen thousand dollar mattress or whatever but uh, since these are presumably getting better results and so forth perhaps it, it would uh, the integrated system would be uh, much more desirable and worth the money while well, I, I don't know about the fifteen thousand dollar mattress but worth the money but still uh, yes so actually I have to highlight here the the work was actually done uh, in, in a, a team of ours with Deepak Ganesan who's a uh, who, who's a academic uh, interest actually line signal processing. So part of the reason that we could actually give you really nice breathing data that looks very um, clean, actually, when you when you looked at that first slide, is there's actually a signal processing routine that we uh, extract the very dirty, uh, noisy signals coming out of your body, and we apply a probabilistic graph method to actually extract out those breathing signals. There's an ECG electrode in the pajama as well, and we use that to calibrate your, your breathing rate, so we know when your heart pumps, and that's when the, the breathing um, uh, peak actually shows up, and so we could say any other peak that's past a particular frequency does not correspond to breathing, it actually comes from maybe you moving around or shuffling around or something is flying around as you're sleeping. And mattresses don't have that because they can't measure your heart rate. And so there's actually no kind of landmark to say this is your heart pumping and then this is your breathing peak. And so you really can't uh, filter out these random spurious noises. So um, a mattress in terms of an integrated system is actually not the best way to go, but we completely agree with you. We actually are making a fully integrated system. So right now what we're doing is making a pant in addition to an eye mask. Um, the pant actually has a piezo sensor in this particular time um, with a PVDF polymer. And that piezo sensor actually could sense your strain on your back, so the lower uh, back muscles. So and also there's one in the collar of the shirt now for your neck. And that tells you if you're kinking your neck or your back as you're sleeping at night. And the eye mask also measures your eye motion. And so in that particular sense, the, the system is all integrated on your body. But if you have a mixture of your breathing rate, your heart rate, and then your eye motion, um, it actually tells you whether you're going into REM sleep and for how long, for example, very, very accurately. And then on top of that, if you have these sensors that are telling you if you're kind of kinking your back, it tells you again, as you're sleeping, you're not sleeping well or you're not getting a good quality of sleep. And so that's the, the kind of integration that we're moving toward. Well, I, uh, my, my in intent actually was to interview the system to adjust the mattress to fit your, your sleeping patterns uh. and, and so forth. Because frankly, uh, measuring is one thing. Signal processing is another thing. But to integrate the whole thing it is so you actually get a better night's sleep would be the highly desirable end result. I, I agree. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any mechanical engineering collaborators to make better mattresses with us, but I'm open to the possibility. Thank you. Thank you. The archive version of the session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Orlando 2019. 
Please join us for our next press conference at 1030 a.m. today on fish slime, an untapped source of potential new antibiotics. Thank you.